Coming to you from Beaumont, this is your house call. I want to take you on a journey back in time. We're going to jump in the, in the way back machine and we're going to go 20 years into the past. The year is 1998. The management of diabetes has made huge strides with the use of home glucose meters, long and short acting insulin formulations, oral agents to treat hyperglycemia, and even insulin pumps. But this new technology, while it's pretty widely available, is expensive and it's generally pretty slow to catch on. Even though some of this technology has been around for years, it's really not being utilized as effectively as it could be. So the consequence is that most people with diabetes are managed with regimens that are really fairly inadequate to keep their blood glucose in an acceptable range. Uh, so they're not really managing their diabetes in an optimal way, and there's clearly tons and tons of room for improvement. So let's jump back in the, in the time machine and come back to the present, fast forward 20 years to now. And we're certainly not perfect, but diabetes management has shot light years into the future since our last stop. Blood glucose meters are still in use, but now the technology has been replaced with continuous glucose monitors, smartphone technology, and even some potential applications in the world of non-invasive glucose monitoring. As far as management of diabetes, we still have insulin, but there's so many different formulations and kinds of insulin available. You've got long-acting, short-acting, concentrated insulin. And now there's also these other new drugs that are coming out, including many of the what we call non-insulin injectables like GLP-1, which stands for glucagon-like peptide drugs, uh, synthetic versions of amylin, and SGLT, which stands for sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitors. So the net effect of all these advancements is that diabetes in the 21st century is still a huge public health issue that no one could deny. But today we have the weapons to win the war in a much more meaningful way that we've really never been able to before. And so that's where the conversation is going to go today. We're going to talk about diabetes. Hello and welcome to the Beaumont House Call podcast. I'm Dr. Nick Gilpin. Today we're going to talk diabetes management in the 21st century, and we're going to talk with my good friend, Dr. Mike Brennan. Mike is an endocrinologist with Beaumont. He's the director of the Beaumont Endocrine Center. Dr. Brennan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you for having me here. For sure. So, Mike, um, you're an endocrinologist. Uh, I was hoping that this would be the opportunity where um, you could talk a little bit about yourself and about endocrinology. What do you do? What kind of things do you see? Well, the endocrinologist is the doctor in your neighborhood who takes care of hormone problems. It's not always the most easy doctor to identify because endocrine uh, comes from the Latin root, which means to secrete within, which talks about how the glands in the body communicate to the rest of the body what it would like done. As far as endocrinology is concerned today, you might know the endocrinologist as the person who specializes in diabetes because insulin is a hormone and the endocrinologist is a hormone specialist. Other hormone disorders that endocrinologists are very used to dealing with are multiple because hormone disorders affect you throughout your entire life and have multiple, multiple uh, disease path pathways. And so we deal with thyroid disease, we deal with osteoporosis, we deal with transgender disorders and giving people hormone therapy. We deal with hyperlipidemia because that's a metabolism problem. But in today's world with the scourge of type 2 diabetes in particular and diabetes in general, diabetes makes up probably 60% of the endocrine center practice. Okay. And of those, uh, our practice is generally between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Okay. So about two-thirds of what you do is related to diabetes. What chunk of, within that subset of diabetes, how much of that is type 1, how much of that is type 2? So when you come to the endocrine center, a, a good majority of primary care physicians try to take care of type 2 diabetes on their own. I think that it's more important we kind of digress for a minute between what's the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Thank you. You were thinking one step ahead of me on that. So, so type 2 diabetes is actually a problem that starts with over-insulin secretion. In fact, that's why when you were referencing your historic points and these new drugs having such a, such a historic intervention in type 2 diabetes is because in type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. And so when you're first diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you have too much insulin on board. It's just that the insulin does not 
is not able to communicate with the cells clearly, and therefore this leads to high blood glucose instead of storing the blood glucose. The idea here is that this is almost like an insulin resistance scenario. So your body is producing insulin, but your or your pancreas is producing insulin, but your body's not responding to the insulin that you're creating. Correct? Right. The hormone is in the blood. In fact, it's in the blood in surplus. Sure. It's just not able to take the glucose out of the blood and store it into the proper places. This happens mainly in the United States because of obesity, but it's also a phenomenon that we see with medications such as steroids, or we might see it in pregnant individuals. That's why we test for gestational diabetes, is because there's this transient time when the placenta makes the, the body very resistant to insulin in the third trimester when you have gestational diabetes testing, and then subsequently the re resistance goes away and therefore the patient's body is able to remain what's called homeostasis or its natural balance okay. with the insulin it has on board. Now people with type two diabetes, they frequently can sometimes re change that insulin resistance as well by becoming thinner. Okay. And therefore that's the diabetes not becoming undone, it's just that the body is now able to handle its insulin on board better. Can I think of, uh, practically speaking, can I think of that as sort of a cure. So if I have type 2 diabetes and, and it's related to obesity and I lose a lot of weight, am I curing diabetes through weight loss? So I would have to answer that as no. Okay. okay. It's just as if you, how many times has an individual been pregnant? Once you're pregnant once, you've been pregnant once. Once you have diabetes once, you have diabetes once. Okay. Now, what you can do is adjust the amount of intervention with regard to what medicines you need, what type of lifestyle modif modifications you need. But your body has already proclaimed itself as having a form of insulin resistance or is insulin resistant if you carry the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. That doesn't mean that you should not try to lower your insulin resistance. Sure. Okay. And that's done through diet and exercise and can, in fact, be done without medicine whatsoever. Right. Something that's going to augment your body's ability to take up the insulin that it's already producing. Exactly. Understood. Now, just to clarify again, we had started about type 1 diabetes. Yep. Type 1 diabetes is actually a different disease. It's a disease of insulin deficiency. And you know, and I know this a little bit better than most, as I have type 1 diabetes myself. But type 1 diabetes means you have no insulin left in the tank. And therefore, the only way with which you can combat type 1 diabetes is to give insulin because you have an insulin deficiency. Ironically, the two disease uh, pathology processes go to the same place, which means excess glucose in the blood and glucose in the urine, which is what diabetes means. Okay. Excess glucose in the urine. So if you're deficient of insulin, you can't store glucose properly. And if you have insulin resistance, you can't store glucose properly. But one is a deficiency of insulin and one is an excess or a resistance of insulin. Understood. So I have two different roads, two different pathways, ultimately leading to the same outcome, which is a, an excess of, of blood glucose. Let's talk about for a second, I wanna, I wanna grab something that you mentioned just a second ago, and that is your, your personal story um, with type one diabetes, because I think that this is important. You talked about a, a minute ago, um, folks that have type two diabetes, this is generally something that's brought on through obesity or, uh, or, or diet or what we call commonly in medicine, the, the metabolic syndrome. So this is an acquired condition usually in people that um, have some predisposing factors. Can you talk a little bit about how that's different from type 1 diabetes? Okay, so type 1 diabetes is generally hallmarked by happening in younger individuals who are generally thin because the individual lacks the hormone insulin and therefore isn't able to store fat. Therefore, they rely on other forms of uh, resources for energy and the fat stores are deteriorated and they're generally thin at the time of diagnosis. Now, 
This does not have to necessarily happen in youth and can happen as late as life is 80s and 90s with another condition that has the same pathogenesis called latent onset autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. Okay. It's called LADA. So that is how that is hallmarked. Now back to the question with regard to how it's different than type 2 diabetes in presentation is that it's insidious with type 2 diabetes. The insulin resistance builds up over time. Like you described, it's generally attributed to those who are obese. And obesity doesn't happen overnight either. And this is why when you ask the first question about like when I can I undo the diabetes and take it away, particularly in type 2 diabetes, that's not true because that whole insidious process has been damaging blood vessels, damaging eyes, damaging kidneys, and for a good part of it, likely been undiagnosed. In fact, there's statistics that show a good portion of the United States, maybe a quarter, has diabetes but doesn't know it. And then furthermore, there's data that supports the fact that people have type 2 diabetes for 10 years before it's diagnosed, meaning sure. the pathogenesis of the disease has already started. Now lastly, with regard to your genetic factors, it is true that type 2 diabetes is a more inherited pattern than type 1 diabetes, which appears to be more random, but both have genetic components. And they're also the social economic status part of type 2 diabetes makes it more complex, right? If your family doesn't exercise or eat healthy, this happens to children in that household, et cetera, et cetera. So is it really a true social environmental factor or is it a true gene factor? And those things are tough to decipher in medicine. Understood. I, I guess I want to go back to, to just clean this up a little bit more. This is more, I think, for my own education, frankly. I, I suppose I've always sort of had this archetype in my mind of type 2 diabetes being a slower, more insidious process. Type 1 diabetes, typically there is a triggering event that happens, an autoimmune event, an illness that precipitates this. Am I totally off base here, or is this, is this pretty accurate? This has really kind of always been how I've thought of things. So I would say you're relatively accurate with regard to how you said it. Type 2 is insidious, type 1 is relatively quick happening, but the etiology of type 1 diabetes being infectious or genetic or type 2 diabetes being environmental or genetic is not only variable, it's not understood. Understood, okay. Got but it. I would agree with you that the short act, the short time with which it takes to develop type 1 diabetes or latent onset autoimmune diabetes is quick compared to the time in which it takes to develop type 2 diabetes. I want to further kind of break these, uh, these conditions down, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, in terms of the relative urgency that they would need insulin. So for instance, a, a person who has type 1 diabetes has a significant need for insulin. They are insulin deficient. And if you don't give that person insulin, they could become seriously ill or die in a matter of days or, or weeks. Versus a person who has type 2 diabetes, if you deprive that person of supplemental insulin, you know, you're, you're prolonging the disease process, but that person is not in a, as much of a clear and present danger. Is that fair to say? I would agree 100%. So the person with type 1 diabetes is insulin dependent, as is any person, but the person is insulin deficient. Therefore, insulin is needed. In type 2 diabetes, most of them have, again, insulin excess at the time of early diagnosis, so they can go without treatment for a little bit with insulin. The only caveat to that, Dr. Gilpin, is that if you've had type 2 diabetes for a long time, your beta cells, which are the insulin-producing cells of the body, start to fail. And then the type 2 person becomes insulin-dependent as well, which is confusing to a great deal of people because they call themselves type 1 when they're older on insulin and obese and still insulin-resistant. Right. And this is not a factor of the fact that they don't have type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. This is a factor of requiring insulin because the beta cells are so tired and can't produce insulin anymore. Makes sense. So I, I'm, a, I'm a patient with type 2 diabetes. I've had an abundance of insulin secretion my whole life. Eventually, the cells that produce that insulin just burn out. And now I'm not technically a person with type 1 diabetes because my pancreas cells don't produce insulin, I'm still type 2 diabetes. It's just that the disease has sort of shifted. Well, you are 
like type 1 diabetes, now insulin dependent, Okay. but you still carry insulin resistance. Understood. Okay. It really has to hang on the words kind of insulin resistant and non-insulin resistant diabetes, but we summarize it with the terms type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I know that the, the terminology of, of uh, various medical conditions has changed significantly in the last several years. And I heard uh, from a good friend of mine that uh, it's no longer considered uh, kosher, per se, to call a person diabetic. Is that correct? So yeah, Nick, I'm glad you brought that up. As being a person who has diabetes, it's not always been, it's not very pleasant to be a, referred to a person who is a diabetic. And you can see how that would sound insulting to a person at the bedside or to be named by the disease state. So that the disease state is defining who I am. So I'm a, a person who has diabetes. Sure, so right? it's, a, it's a label, it's a, it's a pejorative label that we should be really steering away from, yeah? Sure, so the American Diabetes Association even says we shouldn't use that lingo anymore. It would be no different than ostracizing a person, calling them a leper on the side of the street. And now it's not as dramatic as that because sure. obviously it's much more ubiquitous throughout the entire population and people have diabetes, but um, we should not define the person by the disease state. Good to know because I guarantee that there are a lot of people listening right now that had no idea that that was the case. Right, I mean, it, again, it's common vernacular. So I want to talk about uh, another thing, and that is for uh, for the people who are listening right now who have some sort of foundational questions about diabetes. So if I'm a listener and I'm concerned, I'm, I'm listening to you sort of describing what diabetes is and how it's classified, how do I know that this is a conversation that I need to have with my doctor? What are some things that, that could... Uh, be considered red flags for me that are going to take me to my primary care doctor to have this conversation? So there are several things you can do. One of the best places to go is cdc.gov and take the pre-diabetes test. Another option for you to do is uh, look at the cdc.gov and see what defines diabetes and pre-diabetes. But what kind of symptoms? What am I looking for? I mean, if With regard to if you're sitting in your room and wondering, I think I might have diabetes because I'm overweight or because I have a family history of diabetes, you very may well be right, and you should have it investigated. And the symptoms when the diabetes is uncontrolled are the symptoms that you can notice clinically. Okay. The problem with a great deal of type 2 diabetes is it's silent. So that is why you need your professional help of your clinician to help use testing as well as take a screening test to help you determine your risk. You can't just feel it with regard to diabetes until it becomes clinically apparent. And when it becomes clinically apparent, it's uncontrolled. And those symptoms go such as increased thirst. Sometimes it's weight loss, weight gain, urinating all the time. I would say a, a telltale sign that I see in people who didn't know how they had that diabetes and it ki came on kind of suddenly is they notice the frequency with which they go to the bathroom at night. It increases. It increases noticeably when it's uncontrolled. Talk about sort of what your process is like for when you are seeing a patient for the first time or maybe a patient who's been newly diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Talk about sort of your process. How do you, how do you start this whole uh, journey? So this is a great question, right? Because they present to me on insulin maybe for the first time that's been uncontrolled, but I have to determine their history. I want to know if they have the insulin resistant type of diabetes or the non-insulin resistant type of diabetes. And immediately when we go down that path, we ask, how were you diagnosed? If the answer was, I suddenly had lots of thirst, I was urinating all the time, I lost massive amount of weight, I went to the doctor's office, my blood sugar was through the roof, I went to the hospital, I left the hospital on insulin. Those all hallmark insulin deficiency and not insulin resistance. When I take the approach with the patient with type 2 diabetes, I ask for the history. The history goes something like this. Yeah, 30 years ago my doc told me I was borderline. Then, you know, they gave me some pills. I took those, didn't take them all the time like I was supposed to. Then he told me to take another couple pills. <laughs> and now I'm supposed to be taking shots and I'm supposed to talk to you over the last 30 years. 
that's not obviously insulin deficiency because obviously if it was insulin deficiency 30 years ago, they would have been on insulin. So that is insulin resistance because it can be managed without needing insulin at that time. But again, the reason they're probably coming to see me for insulin at this time, 30 years later, is they're progressing to insulin deficiency, but they still carry insulin resistance. I think this segues nicely to the jump where we should talk about these things called glucagon-like peptide 1, which is an injectable form of medication for type 2 diabetes that treats insulin resistance, and also these things called sodium, gluco sodium glucose-like transporter 1, which is SGLT2-1 and SGLT2, sodium glucose-like transporter 2 uh, inhibitors. That's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how we do that more clearly. It's sodium-like glucose transporter 2. That's I love the it. drug. I love it just the way you said it. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 let, so, yeah, so let's parse so this So the out. beauty of these agents is they're not for type 1 diabetes necessarily. They're for insulin resistance or not insulin deficiency, but making sure that insulin works better. And that's why they're miraculous. And that's why they're amazing. Because before, in a type 2 diabetes state, we were tra treating, remember, it's a hyperinsulinemia, or excess insulin in the blood state, by giving more shots. Sure. Well, that's not taking care of insulin resistance. That's just like knocking down the door of the cell to accept the insulin. Okay. These drugs help reduce the insulin resistance and try and get rid of the insulin in other ways, and they promote weight loss. The American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists actually states that after metformin, these are the agents that should be chosen next, okay. GLP-1 and SGLT-2. Have these drugs been shown to not only improve quality of life, but also to prolong the life of someone who has type 2 diabetes? In fact, these are a very miraculous class of drug because for a long time we had no evidence of stopping cardiovascular problems with diabetes. Type blood glucose control has long been shown to decrease blindness, decrease kidney disease, and decrease amputation. Those are what are called microvascular complications. We did not have any evidence to stop macrovascular complication, which is like stroke, heart, disease. heart attack, yeah myocardial infarction, but these drugs in the short period that they've been on this earth with regard to the treatment of diabetes have actually shown decreased cardiovascular events in both the SGLT2 class, one drug in particular called empagoglifazolin, and in the GLP1 class, one drug in particular called liraglutide. Okay. And these are groundbreaking studies in the sense that for years we've been studying how to stop heart attack and stroke in people with diabetes and these have shown to do it in the background of people also being treated for hypertension on aspirin and on lipid lowering agents. So you know as a scientist in order to demonstrate an, a statistical difference between two populations and you're giving them standard of care which is excellent to just add another another drug to see a change in disease distribution that quickly is pretty impressive. Absolutely impressive. So let me translate that. If I'm a, if I'm a patient who has type 2 diabetes, I really should, I guess I should probably be talking to my doctor about getting a medication like this on board, or at least my doctor should be talking to me about getting a medication like this on board. Would it be fair to say that at this point? I would uh, wholeheartedly agree that there's certain drugs that people with type 2 diabetes should be on. Metformin is the standard. I would say that these two new classes are new, but could be considered standard. Aspirin is a standard, probably. A statin therapy and antihypertensive therapy with regard to kidney production. Okay, let me ask a philosophical question now. So I, I take care of patients. I, I, uh, I don't do what you do, but I see patients a lot uh, in the hospital, out of the hospital. I'm not seeing a lot of these medications being utilized. What, what's the holdup here? Probably the number one cost, uh, the number one problem is cost probably amongst the insurers okay. and amongst cost to the patient. But largely the formulary drives a lot of this stuff. Okay. Meaning, also, meaning what the insurance company will allow a prescriber to use? Correct. You know, you can want to give these drugs to all of your patients, right. but if your healthcare program, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid or Blue Cross and Blue Shields or HAP, doesn't provide coverage with this drug, then it's not an option for you, realistically. 
obviously in the United States, if you can afford to buy it, you can get it. Sure. But there's a cost limitation. Well, that's, you know, that's a really good point and, and, and sort of an infuriating point, I think, for, for you and for me. This is something you and I have talked about um, many times before is, is uh, you know, some of these health policy decisions and how this, uh, sadly, I think, drives us and pushes us in the wrong direction at times. But, but uh, for the clarity, though, there's actually a great deal of the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s are covered by Medicare and Good. other insurances. So they are available. They do have to use stepwise therapy, which is another catchphrase for insurances to like try and use lower, uh, more affordable costs to get to these drugs. But they are available. And if documented properly, you can get them covered. I would say the other limiting factor is that docs just don't know. Okay. I think that unfortunately for a our population who's having increasing type 2 diabetes, there's a great deal of primary care physicians, um, whether they are internal medicine, family practice, your nurse practitioner, your physician assistant, who were trained in an era in which they didn't even know of these drugs. When I teach the residents at our medical school at Beaumont or at the residents and the medical students at the hospital, I often ask them to raise their hand if they've learned of these drug classes. And that has only happened in the last probably five years to two years that the, the residents and the med students have heard of the class of medication, meaning that in past years, they didn't even know about it because they hadn't been taught about it. It's only available to the doctors in the community through advertising on TV or going to continuing medical education or having drug representatives come to your office. A lot of these means are prohibited in our health system as well. I would be completely missing the boat if I didn't talk about insulin and the various types of, of insulin delivery that's available. We can't talk about diabetes in the 21st century without talking about how we're delivering insulin to people who need insulin now. I'm talking about pumps, I'm talking about continuous blood glucose monitors. I mean, this is some hot technology that we really have to talk about. So insulin first discovered in the 1920s is first delivered to humans from uh, via vial and syringe. And that is the way and method with which we still get insulin today. But the method with which the delivery has changed is that instead of drawing it up out of the vial and syringe, we now have better packaging or better formats with which to deliver it. One such method is through an insulin pen. The insulin is inside a cartridge-like device that has a small needle that then can deliver the insulin subcutaneously. Another method is via insulin patch. An insulin patch is a reservoir of insulin on your skin that you wear around, and the insulin is delivered subcutaneously that way, and you press a button and more insulin is administered, like for a meal. Another way of insulin delivery is the insulin pump, in which the insulin is also continuously given under the skin, and you can manipulate the device to give more or less depending on your blood sugar or depending on what you're going to eat. All of them are subcutaneous delivery systems and are available to us. But different than the, the old school model of, uh, you know, carrying around a vial in your purse and, and a needle and having to, you know, draw You say and, that, and but push. again, because of cost, there is a large majority of the population in the United States that still needs vial still and syringe. Doing, sure, sure, and sure. That's a good point. I'm glad you pointed that out. They can control their diabetes with vial and syringe. Yeah. And they carry it around in their purse. And in fact, I have patients that choose to use vial and syringe because the cost of the pen, the cost of the patch, the cost of the pump, prohibitive. I hope that as science catches up that uh, we can start to make those technologies more readily available. Because I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the science is really starting to catch up and it's starting to say that these insulin delivery mechanisms, these blood glucose monitors are better than what we were using 20 years ago. And there really is a need. We just have to let that catch up. Fair to say? I would say that insulin delivery with regard to convenience is definitely important. The patient is more likely to carry the pen. The patient isn't likely to miss the injection if the patch is stuck on go. them, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an adherence uh, value to these methods of delivery. Okay. Um, with regard to blood sugar testing, the change has been monumental in the last five to 10 years. We've gone from poking our fingers all the time to now having devices that you wear and then relay your blood sugar without finger poking. You still have to be struck or have the device placed under the skin the first day, but you wear these devices for anywhere from seven to 10 days 
and they relay the blood sugar to you, which is amazing because most people prior to the advent of this in the last decade had to strike their finger four or five times a day to find out this information. Absolutely. So are you telling me that I'm kind of moving maybe slower than I would like to, but I'm, I am moving away from the days of having to do finger sticks over and over and over again if I'm a patient who has type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Yes. Good. That's, I think that's going to be music to a lot of people's ears. So I, I, uh, I think we could probably talk about diabetes forever and ever. I know it's a passion of yours. I want to thank my friend, Dr. Mike Brennan, for coming on the podcast. Mike, thanks for coming. No problem. Thank you for having me. Mike, if, uh, if there's folks out there that are listening, do you want to give us a, a quick shout of uh, where we can find you? So I'm at the Beaumont Endocrine Center. My office is located in St. Clair Shores. There's also the Beaumont Endocrine Center located in Beverly Hills, Michigan. These are Beaumont Health System Endocrine Centers available to the community for doctors as well as patients for consults on all endocrine disorders. And we'll bring you back, I think. I th there's an opportunity here to, to, to creep into some of the other areas of endocrinology, which it's a fascinating, fascinating field. There's just so much we could talk about. I also want to remind you to send along uh, any questions or suggestions to podcast at beaumont.org. And we'll be covering a lot of ground between myself and Dr. Asha Shah Jahan in future podcasts. I want to leave you today with this healthy thought. Diabetes remains a significant public health threat today, just as it has for the past several decades. But there is science and there is hope. And hope comes in the form of many new innovations to help you better manage your blood sugar. With motivation and proper medical care and the help of a good physician, diabetes does not have to own you and it does not have to define you. Thank you.